Well, it's time to try to figure out um, how to measure power down at these low frequencies. Um, we know that our power meter probably isn't reading accurately. Um, we would like to be able to measure SWR so we can match our antenna. And I really don't even know how much power the transmitter is putting out or what its efficiency is. Uh, this is a pair of 6146Bs. That's what's in the transmitter. We can look at the data sheet and it tells us that uh, these are capable of upwards of 70 some odd watts out each. Um, with the PI output network that I have and proper drive, uh, what can I get with these tubes? I'm running pretty high voltage, 700 volts on the plates. Um, I should be able to run them at absolutely full power. So I'm excited to uh, try to do some measurements on the transmitter to use the transmitter on the air. There's another issue. It's called EIRP, Effective Isotropic Radiated Power. Um, different countries have different limits. For our particular country, it's 5 watts EIRP. Now, I thought that was really clever to use a very technical measurement like that uh, on, uh, with the ham radio community because it's virtually impossible to measure and it sends a really cool message. The message is, um, be careful. Um, you may be exceeding a limit that you really can't measure. So you'd better keep your power down, guys. This is encouraging lower power QRP operation, in effect, because you might exceed the limit and we might have to send the snooper truck out after you. So let's find out how limited we are in understanding how to actually measure the efficiency of our antennas as part of this video. I'm finding that uh, my instruments like this power meter are lying to me. They work fine on 80 meters, but they don't seem to work down here in 630 meters. So we're going to also discuss what we need to do to measure SWR accurately and power accurately at these low frequencies. So there's quite a few ways of measuring power. When it comes to these low frequencies, um, you'd like to be able to measure your output power because uh, one of the rules on 630 meters is you're not to exceed 5 watts EIRP. So you'd like to know what your power is at this low frequency. The traditional way of measuring power at the VLF range is to use something called an RF ammeter. Now an RF ammeter uh, basically, uh, it measures the power through a thermocouple that's inside the meter. And this little one here, for instance, if it was at 1, it would be um, I squared R, right? And R is 50 ohms. So it would be 1 times 1 is 1 times 50, 50 watts. So mid-scale, we're talking about 50 watts with an RF ammeter. And full-scale, this guy probably would read like 120 watts, something like that. So that's the first way to measure power. And we'll see later how RF ammeters are very important for your antenna current. So I would like to uh, figure out what my actual power output is of this transmitter. I don't know how efficient my output tank circuit is. And even if I'm running 70 watts input power or something, how much am I actually delivering to the coax cable? So the first thing I did is I've uh, got my signal generator set for around 500 kilohertz, and I'm producing a 2-volt peak-to-peak sine wave. Now, I have this really nice 50-ohm, 150-watt load, and I figure if I just put a simple 10-to-1 voltage divider off the... Uh, off the load, 
I should be able to hook it up to the scope, take a peak-to-peak -peak measurement, and come up with the voltage and uh, be able to calculate the power output at 470 kilohertz. So, the first thing I wanted to do was design a little voltage divider. So, you know, you think about it and say, okay, maybe a 10K resistor and a 1K resistor. That'll give me a 10 to 1 voltage divider. Certainly 10 or 11K isn't going to load down 50 ohms, and uh, especially at 500 kilohertz. So, and then somebody says, Mike, you didn't do the math on the voltage divider. It's actually going to be less than 10 to 1. Uh, you, this resistor is probably going to need to be more like 1.2K or something like that to get a true 10 to 1. I did the math. Well, anyway, let's see what I am getting on the, uh, on the 10 to 1. Now, we were seeing 2 volts peak to peak, so we'd like to get 200 millivolts. And we're getting 200 millivolts. Okay, what's wrong? Why are we getting 200 millivolts? We should be getting something less than that. And uh, I'll show you why. It's really kind of weird. If you disconnect the, uh, the, the voltage divider and you hook up the meter, um, and you measure that 1K resistor. Hopefully you guys can see that you can. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so we've got our voltage divider disconnected. Let's measure. Let's measure this thing with our meter. And let's get on that 1K resistor first. Measure him. And it reads 1.24K. Aha! Looks like our 1K resistor is uh, aged and has gone up in value to 1.24K. What about the 10K? He would have gone up too, right? He's an old resistor. Let's look at him. Oh no. The 10K stayed put. So, don't believe anything. The 1K resistor increased in value just enough to form a perfect 10 to 1 voltage divider. So, uh, also utilizing Ohm's Law, we can measure power by using the voltage method. In this case, uh, I've added a 10 to 1 voltage divider onto the power load resistor, the 50 ohm resistor, and a piece of coax going to my RMS voltmeter, which is accurate up to 15 megahertz, so it's going to work fine down here. So in this case, it's E squared over R or the voltage we read squared divided by 50 ohms. So I took the time to calculate out how many volts equals how many watts. So um, 80 volts, for instance, is 126 watts. And uh, that would be 8.0 volts on the RMS voltmeter. Now, how much power do you think a pair of 6146s can produce with a fairly stout 700 volt power supply. I know some of you look up, you know, the data sheet and say, oh, 66 watts, or if, a, if it's a 6146B, maybe as much as 72 watts, and so on. So, we're not talking about 100 watts here. We're talking about a fairly honest 120, 130 watts uh, should be where this transmitter uh, maxes out. And uh, we'd also like to know what's the minimum power that the transmitter can operate at. Now we can turn the drive down and starve the grid of the finals to reduce the power, but just based on proper grid current on the finals, what's the minimum power just using the loading control and the uh, tap switch that we can produce with the transmitter? That's where we're going to okay, start. Okay, let's do some power measurements. I have the uh, transmitter in the tune position. I'm at uh, 473.5 kilohertz. Let's uh, press the key and see if we can get some power out. Okay, let's dip the plate. It's dipped. And we're reading 10 watts on the power meter. Let's go to the smaller scale. Yeah, just about 10 watts on the power meter. And we're reading just a little over 4 volts on the RMS voltmeter. Now we can see that 4 volts is going to be between 
10 and 50 watts so it's probably somewhere around 30 watts so the meter is reading one-third of the actual output power on this particular scale so let's see if we can bring it up to this 44 number bring this up a little bit this is a loading control redip okay so that's right 4.4 that's 50 watts out and we're reading you know like uh, 15 watts out so we're getting an honest 50 watts out of the transmitter and the power meter of course is lying plus the SWR is horrible okay let's take it up a little bit let's go to the operate mode and try dipping the plate again okay now we're at 60 like 64 so we're over 80 watts we're over 80 watts on this thing remember I told you this transmitter can put out quite a bit of power let's uh, bring up the loading a little bit see if we can get even more out of it okay we're at 70 so that's an honest 100 watts and we're not even fully loaded okay so now let's bring the loading down and let's go to the next tap this is Next tap, let's see what we got here. Okay, so that's 8.5. We're over 120 watts out. Unbelievable. So we're getting uh, an honest 125 watts out, and I'm reading just about. 160 watts input power. 160 watts with 125 watts out. So the output tank is doing a good job and this transmitter is capable of putting out a lot of power. So we have proven that the voltage divider method off a, uh, a 50 ohm load works very well to measure power. Our little uh, setup here with our 10 to 1 voltage divider and our non-inductive uh, resistor, this is a 150 watt load, uh, was a fairly simple way to measure RF power at 630 meters and of course at 2200. And you can use either a scope or you can use an RMS voltmeter. Um, I would be a little cautious trying to use a multimeter, however, because you're not sure how high in frequency these can actually measure. Now, uh, we went over the RF ammeter. Now, is the RF ammeter a watt meter? Well, yes it is. If you hook it up to a known load, you can measure watts, but uh, most of the time when you're using an RF ammeter, the load is unknown, such as the, uh, the antenna itself above or below the loading coil. We don't know exactly what that impedance is, but we do know what the RF current is. And in that way we can, uh, we can make measurements of the current at least, and uh, try to ascertain what the actual load is. And that's how you can measure power in the antenna. But if you have a known 50 ohm match condition, this ammeter using Ohm's Law can give you the, uh, the watts answer just as easily. So, lately, people have been using this little device. You guys might recognize this. This is the Analog Devices 8307. And this little chip is a logarithmic power detector. It's a successive detection logarithmic power detector done in CMOS 
and it's a very, very effective uh, uh, linear and DB type power meter chip uh, developed with a team uh, around Barry Gilbert, uh, a famous uh, engineer at Plessy and later on at Analog Devices. I uh, used to have contact with Barry at ADI. Um, it was uh, wonderful to work around him. Anyway, this chip is very popular now for measuring power. And uh, with a little RF pickup, such as a, uh, a toroid or something like this, um, you can hook that up to that device and uh, you can uh, drive a meter, any, any type of meter, or uh, of course people want to drive a digital meter that's calibrated in milliwatts or watts. And you can buy those kits as well. But I thought maybe we should do an old-fashioned power meter uh, using a, uh, a toroid with a, a sense going through it from SO239 to 239 and getting a forward and a reflected power measurement. I've got a nice meter here. It's a 50 microamp movement out of an old HP generator. We're going to take this apart, make our own face for it, and be able to measure forward and reverse power for uh, 630 meters. And uh, this should be a fun little project making a real power meter uh, for the uh, for the LF band. Okay, so I've got the roughing done. Uh, the meter's basically cut out. That was fun. I used some metal shears for that. The two SO239s are mounted and a place for the switch. This is one of those wholly uh, recovered chassis I like to use up. And next we start to uh, work on a schematic and uh, collect parts for the power meter. So as we build our SWR power meter for the low frequencies, um, my case is starting to get a little bit crowded because I wanted to add, uh, you know, forward power in a couple of ranges. I also wanted to have an SWR function in the meter. And uh, I did not have a dual section rotary switch where I could do some really fancy switching. I just had a simple one, two, three, four rotary switch. So to add the SWR function I needed to add a separate switch for forward and reverse. Which is actually handy. I think when you're doing SWR measurements it's easier to do it that way anyway. In one position you're doing the set control with the potentiometer. In the other position you're, you're just reading the reflected. So that works out okay. So there'll be something like uh, this will be uh, 20 watts forward and then the second position will be uh, 300 watts forward. So maybe 30 watts forward, 300 watts forward, 30 watts reverse, and then SWR. And when you're in SWR, you put it in forward, you set the needle to full, then you just read reflected. So I think that's a a simple way to use a four position rotary switch with a single single pole double throw switch to get both forward and reverse power and to be able to read SWR. Now this is where these dual meters uh, with the forward and reverse uh, movements in one uh, instrument become very very handy and they've taken over the industry with these SWRs. These cross needle type meters are really handy. But to buy one of those uh, will cost you a few bucks. And I had this surplus beautiful meter and I'm going to be reusing that in this in the junk box tradition. Also in the junk box tradition, here are the 50 ohm loads. Now notice this is a nice 51 ohm resistor and I've strapped a looks like a 500 ohm resistor on top of it. Or 680 I guess. That brings us down to exactly 50 ohms. You're going to find that these resistors do drift upward and you have to make little stacks of resistors like this to get your 50 ohms. Again, just buy a couple of 100 ohm uh, metal film resistors or uh, carbon comp or uh, some other type of non-inductive resistor at the 2 watt level and you'll be fine. I was just using some junk box parts and I had my 
my meter to measure them, and that's good enough. I think you'd like to have at least a watt, uh, so a couple of half watts, better yet a couple of one watt resistors at 100 ohms to give you that perfect 50 ohms on each side of the bridge. Here's my BAT85 shock key diodes. I like using the shock keys rather than germaniums. I think they give you a little better square law performance. Um, here's our type 75 cores that we're going to be using in the bridge and a few capacitors. So that's basically the parts uh, in this instrument that we're building. Uh, the fun part of course is going to be the calibration, but uh, let's get started. Now as far as the sampling line goes, you know, between the two connectors, um, one of the toroids is going to go through there. When you wind on this toroid right here, you need to be able to uh, slip the coax through. So ordinary RG58 will work fine, and this is going to be a Faraday setup. So the shield is connected on one side, but disconnected on the other side providing a capacitive uh, uh, protection uh, for the coupling line. So it's a Faraday uh, shield idea on the line. You can use almost any kind of coax. RG58 is, of course, very easy to use. Uh, this is a Teflon type coax. This will work it uh, uh, very nicely. This is silver, silver uh, coated wire. It's RG142 or 141. Anyway, this will work fine as the pickup as well. I think I will use this. The Teflon, of course, can handle a lot higher power, a lot higher voltages, higher voltages at least, and I'll just use a chunk of this. But, yeah, don't feel like you have to use fancy coax for this. You could even use a, a piece of uh, quarter-inch uh, copper tubing with a wire going through it. It's, it's not critical. Okay, I've wound 18 turns of number 22 enameled wire on there. As you can see, it's nice and tight on the RG142 coax. And that's what we're looking for. Very close coupling, good Faraday shield, heavy wire. This should work very well on 2200 and 630 meters. So I have a hen scratch uh, schematic diagram. It's a little bit hard to follow, so I'll put up a, uh, a little better rendition of this. But basically we're going to have a 30 watt, a 300 watt forward, a 30 watt rever reflected or reverse, and then we're going to have an SWR measurement uh, on the four position rotary switch. And this is going to require a set potentiometer, which is on the front chassis, and a uh, set and reflected SWR uh, single pole double throw switch. And it looks like we need some trim pots. One, two, three trim pots to set the ranges uh, into the meter. So let me uh, try to dig out some uh, appropriate uh, trim pots. I've got a bunch of uh, 100K trim pots which I think will work well with a 50 microamp movement because they were using, uh, I think, 50K or 25K resistors with 100 microamp. So somebody was complaining that uh, my bench is too clean when I'm working on stuff. Well, this is what it looks like when we're in the middle of uh, building something. So as you can see, if I would have built this better, I would have put the coupled line through this section and had the connectors here rather than this way. I'm going to get away with it because this is a low frequency project, so the length on this line doesn't really matter. But if you're doing a high frequency or a better coupler, this is kind of what we're looking for. As you can see on one side it's stripped for the grounding, on the other side it's open. This is a nice tight coupling uh, section pickup. So that's what you're going for, something that short if you really want wide band. So uh, while I would love to go on with this video, um, we're going to have to break here because uh, I've got so much more to go over with the, uh, with the power meter. I've got uh, 
Got to go over the EIRP discussion. We've got a lot more to cover. And there were some surprises when I got the power meter built. We're going to go through that too. Stand by for the next video.